They say that confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. And so I'll begin with that this morning with you. I uh, knew we were going to be at this message this day, and I found it very difficult to uh, express in words, writing on paper or on the computer, throughout the week until just this morning. Um, Sometimes, and I know Brother Wayne is like this too, sometimes God makes us wait. You know, when we ask God in prayer, you know, for something to happen in our lives or in the lives of other people, there's several different ways God can reply. He can reply with an affirmative, meaning yes, and it can happen almost immediately, or a no, uh, a denial of the request. But sometimes he says, wait. And I think that maybe you have experienced this, and maybe you've not picked up on this, but God sometimes tells all of us, wait, and he does also us pastors and preachers and teachers of the word and so uh, it wasn't until late this morning until this idea came down now it's not to say that I didn't read through the text and I wouldn't study in the text in different ways doing geeky things like word studies and grammar studies and things like that through the week but I think that we're coming back to a section in this letter that relates back to um, another series that I had preached several years ago about the benefits of being filled with the Holy Spirit. See, Paul is transitioning here in this text today from the this versus this of legalism versus grace now to the practical of this is what grace also brings in the practical living out 
of what the law might say should be the visible effects of one who would follow the law. It's not that we're legalists and we're following an external influence like the law, the Mosaic law, but it's we're following the leadership of the person and the power of the Holy Spirit internal to each and every believer. And see, there's a world of difference between the external trying to conform us, and that's what Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world. And literally, it could be said like this, don't be molded by this world. And there's a world of difference between that kind of shaping or molding than internally you have a motivation and a motivator and a power to enact that which is good, righteous, and holy in God's eyes. And so that's where we come to today in, in this text. We're leaving the more abstract theological to the man on the street where the rubber meets the road in this letter beginning with verse 16. And so I entitled the, 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 the um, message today, the, Be- the Believer's Secret Weapon initially. And then I said, well, wait a minute, that might be a little too vague. The Christian's secret weapon. Paul is going to begin to reveal in greater detail. He's alluded to this in the past, but he's going to reveal in great detail the believer's or the Christian's secret weapon. And I want to say this before we begin today. If you don't get anything out of the day's message, remember this, and if you don't believe it, at least test it. Pick up the word and see if it's not true. You cannot do this life on your own. And you cannot do the Christian life at all on your own. You can't even begin it on your own, much less live it on your own. So without further delay, turn to chapter 5, verse 16 in God's Word. I want to read through verse 26, although by no surprise to you, we're not going to get through verse 26 today, hence part 1 of the message so we begin there at verse 16 and the word of God says but I say walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Lord, the great pastor, D.O. Moody, made a wonderful statement about the absolute necessity of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. And it's that which I wish to communicate today. Lord, through my lips and through your spirit, please ingrain this and entrench this in the minds and hearts of these who listen in this place and who would listen online. That life is not possible without God and the Christian life is impossible without the Holy Spirit. Lord, it's my prayer in Jesus' name this day. Amen. There's a couple of things that we need to take note of here in this text. The most important uh, is in verse 16. Uh, It has to do with what Paul is writing, who Paul is writing, and why he is writing uh, these believers. Uh, And it goes back to human nature. 
And so I want to start with an illustration to kind of show what Paul is sort of kind of addressing in this, in verse 16, with his command to walk by the Spirit. You know, you know, we can look at little children and learn a lot about human nature. I think that all of you, being parents and grandparents, uh, can say that there's many lessons that your children taught you about not only human nature, but about yourself as you were raising these little ones up to be adults. One of the things that I've observed from the observer of children is that they teach us much about our nature as far as this phrase, I can do it myself. I mean, when they're real little, they begin that little road to independence. You know, we want them to get to 18 or 19 or 24 or whatever and be independent and be self-sufficient. But it seems that that desire, that drive to be self-sufficient comes way, way earlier than that. Even by the time they're beginning to crawl, they seem to have this tendency that it's like if they could speak, they can say, I can do this myself. And so whether it's opening the door, for example, you think about all those little toddlers that have reached up there to open that door and grab that doorknob only to find out that that door swings right into themselves and ends with a painful lesson. Or uh, maybe a little older, uh, I can carry all those bags of groceries and help mama in the house, help daddy in the house, you know, only to find out that these bags are much heavier and much weightier and those bags actually tear when you don't handle them the right way and that's a painful lesson too. Um, maybe it's, it's something like uh, walking or running. You know, that, the first few steps, you know, that's, all, that's like a Kodak moment for most parents, right? But then there's always that little bit of overconfidence and then comes that first great fall. And there's the pain that comes with, I can do it myself. And, 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 and you as parents and grandparents, I know you have to resist sometimes the tendency to want to reach out and to grab them or to help them. And it just as recently as this past Friday night when I, I was at the skating rink, yes, the skating rink, <laughs> yes, with Joanne as well, I, I witnessed a mom walking her child from the access to the rink floor with her shoes with this little one. And I'm like going, the perfect picture of a helicopter mom. Let the kid fall. He'll learn. But we want to do that. That's a picture not only of our nature that I can do that, but it's also a picture of how God looks at us. He wants to help us. He wants to give us the things that's necessary just like you do as parents. And that's why Jesus said that it is good for you that I go because if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. My Father will send the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, the one who comes alongside you to be with you and in you and never to leave you. And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we as Christians can even begin to take baby steps toward living a holy, Christ-like, God-pleasing life in our experience here in this world. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there have been ebbs and flows to our devotion, our knowledge, and our understanding of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the provisions of the Holy Spirit, the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. There have been, and in church history, there's been ebbs and flows away from the Holy Spirit, and then too much excess on one side. And I think in the 20th century, we had an excess with Pentecostalism in the beginning of the 20th century, late uh, 19th and early 20th century. And a lot of people, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians, they pushed back from that and they began not to even mention the Holy Spirit, not to even talk about the Holy Spirit, though he's there in the Scripture. Uh, the Scripture is replete with the sufficiency and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. My word, Jesus says, tarry here into the city of Jerusalem. In Luke 24, tarry here in this city, Jerusalem, until you are endued with power on high. And Acts 1, at verse 8, he says, when you receive power, meaning when the Holy Spirit comes, then you will be my witnesses. And what we have done, many of us, and particularly in the Baptist circles, we have pushed away about the Holy Spirit, teaching the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit's purpose is, where he should be, you know, how he should be addressed. I, I, my friend and mentor uh, back in the, in the 40s and 50s, when he was just beginning to preach, he was told in Columbus County, holding a uh, revival in, in Whiteville, he says, you know, Bill, you'll go real far if you'll just tone down that Holy Spirit talk. 
And the unfortunate truth is that is not only ignorance on the behalf of someone who would say that, but it's actually a detriment to all that sit under their teaching. Francis Chan uh, wrote in 2009 a book titled this, The Forgotten God. Guess who the subject of that was? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the, the subtitle goes, Reversing Our Tragic Neglect of the Holy Spirit. The Forgotten God, Reversing Our Tragic Neglect of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of my favorite books that Dr. Bennett introduced to me was a book called The Key to Triumphant Living by Jack R. Taylor. You can buy it, a used book. It's a wonderful book. Jack R. T Taylor wrote many things, great things about the, the necessity and the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. But if we ignore that, we're going to be like those children that said, I can do it myself. And we'll fall repeatedly on our faces. And you know, Sometimes those falls hurt and hurt badly and have long-lasting effect. So the fear, I said this last week, fear is never a great motivator. And when it comes to fear of excess of the person and the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, we do not need to allow fear to drive us away from that which God has given every believer for the purpose of living out the Christ-like life. Dr. Bennett used to say this as well. God accomplishes his person or his purpose in the believer's life by two instruments, the word and the spirit. Did you catch that? Two major instruments in the believer's life, the word and the spirit. And in the 20th century, we went to this great crescendo, this great mountain uh, of the word. Even in the 1970s and 80s when the resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention affirmed and reaffirmed and established in their seminaries as well as in their doctrine that the word is inerrant and infallible. It is the word of God and it is sufficient for all things according to life and godliness. But what happened at the same time is we diminished the role and the power and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Look, a cake is only as good as the sum total of its ingredients. And if you leave the sugar out of a cake or you leave the flour out of a cake, it's not going to be fit to eat for anyone. And the same with our lives as Christians. If we ignore, to our own detriment I add, if we ignore the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be impotent Christians in our walk. We might look good, we might sound good, we might not know all the verses, but we will be effectively powerless. We'll be like an engine that has no gasoline. Maybe in 20 years we might say, we might be like an automobile that has no electricity. The absolute necessity of the Holy Spirit is indisputable according to the dictates and the word of God. But unfortunately our fear has led us away or pushed us away or made us close the door to the person of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is introducing us here to the exact opposite. He is saying that it is not the law external, but it is the Holy Spirit internal, which gives us not only the compass, the bearing of living a life that's godly, but he gives us the power to do that. MacArthur says this, just as Jesus Christ is the primary purpose behind our justification. Okay, remember that's a court term that we've been declared innocent in a court of law. There is no job, double jeopardy for the Christians, folks. There's no one who can bring a charge against the elect, Romans 8 says. And so just as Jesus Christ is the primary person behind our justification. The Holy Spirit is the primary person behind our sanctification. That's how we live once we've been justified, once we've been saved. And the believer can no more sanctify himself than he could save himself in the first place. He cannot live the Christian life on his own resources any more than he could save himself by his own resources. In the most profound yet simple definition, the faithful Christian life is a life lived under the direction and by the power of the Holy Spirit. You notice what he didn't say there? 
He didn't say what you do, nor did he say what you don't do. Living your life under the faithful direction of the Holy Spirit. That is the theme of Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. This is MacArthur again, which Paul tells the believers to walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And consequently, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh or your desires. So let's look at this idea that's here. The idea of walking. Walk. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Walking, this term walking literally is a verb, and it is in the present tense, and it is in a, an imperative mood, which means that it is a command, and that means it's a command that has an ongoing sense of continuation without any end in sight. Walk in the Spirit. He's commanding us to walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, the word walk here is being used as it is elsewhere as a metaphor, spiritually speaking, of how one conducts their lives, the manner in which one lives. So it, when I was in school, uh, beginning in 2006, all the way through 2017, this one word kept coming up again and again and again in my studies, and it was the word worldview. Worldview. And in particular, Christian worldview. You see, what we think, how we think, determines what we will do and say and how we will act. And, and Paul is saying here that if we're led by the Spirit, that our worldview will not be of the world's view of the world, but it will be of God's view of the world, God's view of humanity, and our lives will be lived out in a way that is so different than the world that others will not be able to miss that we're different. That's what Peter said, that we should always live in a way that it would give cause for others to ask us for the reason for the hope that is within us and that we, with gentleness and respect, would tell them it's because Jesus. That's just a paraphrase, I think, of uh, 2 Peter 3.18. And to walk literally means that you have a manner of life that is consistent, that there's a goal out there of living for not self, but for others, and namely, first, Jesus, under the direction of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have uh, GPSs in your car? Okay, there's a few of you have GPS. There was a day before cell phones were so, you know, widespread and so helpful to us that GPSs were the thing. You can think of the Holy Spirit and you wrapped in that envelope on an automobile and that GPS helping you navigate to get to the place that your, your final destination is. Our final destination is a home that's permanent as a Christian. And the way to get there is to follow the Holy Spirit in this life in order to avoid those childlike tendencies that we might have that says, I can do this on my own. Paul even said of himself, I'll gladly revel in my weakness that his power might be revealed in me. That's 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 9, I think. And so what we need to understand is that walking is an ongoing action. It's never, it's never completed in this life. And only when we're glorified and see Jesus will that walk come to an end as far as living a holy life that's God-pleasing. Paul said it like this right in the Ephesian church. Chapter 5, verse 18, he says, Do not get drunk with wine, in which is excess or dissipation or debauchery in some of your translations, but be filled with the Spirit. That idea there in the word filled is the same thing. It's a present tense imperative. It's a being filled or being guided or being controlled by the person of the Holy Spirit in the manner that you live. He's contrasting the way of the world, which is drunkenness, to be controlled by alcohol or be under the influence of alcohol, under the influence of some external thing that you bring to bring part of you. But no, be controlled by the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit instead of this thing over here. 
And Paul is saying to these Galatian believers, it's not about what the Judaizers have been telling you about this list of rules, but it's about the lawgiver himself, which now lives within you. He's the one that calibrates your moral compass. He's the one that says, do this versus that. He's the one that liberates you to live the sanctified life before God. And before that, you were enslaved by sin, and you were assured to sin because of the enslavement to sin. And he's saying, walk by the Spirit. And look what it says there. And you will not carry out the desire or desires of the flesh. Now, let's just get something straight here. Does that mean that a Christian or any Christian is perfect? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Remember that walking is a pattern. And also this idea of living without God and apart from the Holy Spirit is also a pattern. There is a pattern of slavery and there's a pattern of liberty. You've been liberated by Christ. You've been filled or now have the Holy Spirit as your guide for life. And as long as you listen and obey, then you will not fulfill the desires or, in other translations, you might say, lust of the flesh. The question is, is how good we are at listening and obeying. Because remember what Dr. Bennett said, there's two keys, the Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. You can think of the analogy of the automobile like this. Uh, Dr. Bennett used to say about Christians, there, there's so many dysfunctional Christians in, in, in the church in America that they would be like a car that wouldn't run downhill. The word is the engine. The gas is the spirit. You just happen to be temporarily at the wheel to guide that where it goes. We have the spirit inside of us. And he says this way, that way, left, right, up, down. And so this idea of walking by the Spirit has a consequence to it. And it says, if you walk by the Spirit, if you live under the dictate, if you live following the Holy Spirit's leadership, then you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And when we see that opposite effect happen, that just consequently means that we have made up our mind to do it my way. My way rather than his way and we can talk about all all these reasons why we would want to do it my way Paul doesn't really do that here that would be a good thing to do on a Wednesday night study but I think if you're honest with yourself like I am with myself sometimes we do it a lot more my way than we are willing to admit most times And so Paul says this is the command to walk by the Spirit. But there's also a conflict. And that's what we're talking about now. What happens when we don't do it His way, the conflict or the war is evident. So look again uh, down here. We, we read in verse 16, he says, uh, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not car uh, carry out the desire of the flesh. And then verse 17, look at there. It says, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. That's the war. That's where we live most of the time. Do we do it his way or my way? His way or your way? That's where we really live most of the time. We, we, want, we want sometimes that this, this word of God will give us in black and white what to do in every situation or every circumstance. Do I give to this guy on the street corner up here? Do I give to this shelter over here? Do I give to this homeless person over here? Do I, 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 give, do I tithe? Sometimes there's even a question that comes up. How we live, how we speak to one another, how we treat one another, and, and that also goes for the ones that irritate the you-know-what out of us. This is the conflict. You know, there's many signs along the highways and, and the roadways 
that you drive every day. The question is, is do you heed them? Do you heed them? Heard this phrase? Here's your sign. Two instruments, the Word and the Spirit. The Spirit is impeded by our lack of understanding of the Word. We can't listen to Him well if we're not in the Word, of the Word. And He can't instruct us through the Word when we're devoid, devoid of the presence of the Word in our daily time. Just like the signs on the highway, we have a choice to obey them or to disobey them. We have a choice to obey or disobey. But if we don't have this in our hearts, if we don't have this in our mind, if we not stowed it in our heart and meditated on it and, and, and applied it to circumstances and situations, like Dr. Bennett would say, make an advanced decision, man. He would say that to me all the time. Make an advanced decision, man. We have to make an advanced decision about the Word and the Spirit. To obey and to know. Jesus said it like this. John 14 and 15, he repeats this in several different ways. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. That's a pretty hard word. If you don't know his commands, how will you ever know that you love him? And how will you ever obey? And you say, oh, well, the New Testament, all the commands are gone, right? Legalism and law is gone. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I've loved you. That's just one example of a command that Jesus issued. How about the Great Commission? That's not an option. That's a command to go tell others about Jesus. Are we obedient to that? Are we following the Spirit in that? For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That is the conflict. What is the flesh? The flesh is the Greek word sarx. I, I mentioned it briefly last week. I want to go in a little bit greater detail. The flesh is the term that Paul uses very often to describe what remains of the unredeemed old man after we have become saved. You know, we already admitted that we sin after we're saved. And this drills down to a little bit more in detail about what is it about us that still remains that inclines us towards sin after we've been saved. We say in, first, in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we say that all things have been passed away and all things have become new. And that's true. We've been brought to newness of life because we were dead spiritually. And so now we're alive spiritually so we can be in tune with God. We can be in touch with God. We can commune with God in a spiritual sense. But the thing that still remains is this idea of the flesh. What is the flesh? Is he only talking about the body? No, he's not talking about a spiritual versus physical dichotomy between these two. What he is talking about is your desires that you might have that might be fleshly oriented or based. Or the mind, it's habituations that you might have been accustomed to or the learnings that you had before. All of these things... The physical as well as the non-physical elements are characterized by this term, the old man or the flesh. And we still have a disposition to be self-pleasers and selfish people after salvation. That is what is called the flesh. Paul writing in chapter 7, it really hits this really good. It's a long passage, but listen and listen well. Writing in chapter 7, beginning at verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate, he says. But if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now... No longer am I the one doing, but sin which dwells in me. Did you hear that? He said, Paul said, even as a regenerated believer, there's sin, the flesh, that dwells in me. And that's what's compelling me 
to do these things. Anger, outbursts. There's a whole list of them there down below in verse 19 and following. I mean, you, it's easy today, isn't it, to be nice and to smile and to put on the mask. But that's not how we are most of the time. Many of you know that... Um, When you get to know somebody, when you sit in their home, and when you become their friends, you begin to learn intimate details about who they are and their personhood and their personality and, and the characteristics of how they behave. And, and, and Sylvia was asking me some questions here recently, and I said, for the most part, these people knew me before they called me. And in some respects, they understood who I was as a person, as an individual, as a Christian. And so it wasn't out of ignorance that they would say, come be our pastor. That means a lot to me. Because I tell you, you do know me well, many of you. And, and by doing that, you also have not glossed over anything. But you've practiced what 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. If I was fearful of being known as who I truly am, not just some guy that stands up here on Sundays or Wednesdays, if I was truly so afraid of being un uncovered and revealed, I, there's no way I would get up here. Because of your love, I'm able to be who I am and still be a useful instrument in God's hand and hopefully in your lives too. He says, I hate these things that I'm doing. That residue of the flesh abides in me, and I am just profoundly or profusely confused. He goes on and says this. Let's see where I'm at here. Let's start in verse 16. He says, but if I do the very thing that I do not do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. I, but I practice every evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He goes on, verse 21 there in chapter 7, he says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, meaning the flesh, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. Waging war, that's the conflict. That's the conflict between the spirit and the flesh, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin in my members. Wretched man that I am. I think the King James says, oh, wretched man that I am. Has that vocative in there. Oh, wretched man that I am. And he goes on and he says this. Who will set me free from this body of death? Who will set me free from this flesh of sin, in other words? You know, this is a very interesting phrase because it goes into another idea in the ancient world. When a man was convicted in the ancient world, there were, there were areas and there were times and there were periods and there were cultures that would punish the murderer uh, of an individual by taking that dead body and affixing it and tying it to that individual so that he would have to carry that dead body around for an indeterminate and an indefinite period of time. And you know what would happen if left there long enough? That man would die too. Because all the things that would happen to that dead body would eventually invade his body. And on left long enough and uncared for, the murderer would die just like the victim, but in a much more slow and painful and agonizing way. Who will set me free from this body, this flesh of sin? Well, we know what the ultimate answer is. One day when we're laid down in the grave, that's the end of that body of sin. 
And the next time that we see Christ or the next time we see that body, it's going to be what's called the glorified body. No longer tainted by sin. No longer having a predilection or predilection for sin. But it would be perfect just like Christ's body. And he says this. Who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Big exclamation mark there. So then, on the other hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God. But, on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. And therefore, the conflict is that residue within the old system of believing and doing and the new leadership of the Holy Spirit. The question is, is are we going to listen to the Holy Spirit and obey? Let me, let me give you an illustration. So, um, not last night, but the night before, I'm there in the house, I'm by myself, and maybe you can resonate with this, but I'm sitting there and I get the munchies. It's like 8 o'clock, okay? Yeah, anybody can resonate with that? 8 o'clock and got munchies? And so I get up and I go into the kitchen and I open up the cabinet doors and I look down in there and the whole time I'm thinking, you don't need to eat. 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 Well, maybe it's not obvious, but I've lost 20 pounds in two, two months, okay? And it's because I've listened to that voice inside of me that says, you don't need to eat or you don't need to sit down. You don't need to be lazy. You need to exercise. You need to do this. You need to do that, okay? And so I'm looking in there and I said, okay, what can I eat? And I just shut the cabinet doors and I said, I'm going to drink a glass of water. <laughs> Are we going to listen to the Holy Spirit? Are we going to obey the leadership of the Holy Spirit? That's what it really boils down to. The battle of the flesh over the flesh is empowered by the Holy Spirit and his leadership of which we need to know that there's ultimately a consequence that follows from following or failing to follow. What's point number three, the consequence of walking by the flesh. You know, if Paul commands us to walk by the Spirit, he's conversely going to give us the result of not walking by the Spirit or walking by the flesh. And so that's the third point. And so look there at verse 21. The second half of verse 21 as we move along in time here. Uh, the second half there says, of which I forewarned you. So he's now giving you a catalog of what it looks like to be in the flesh, which we're not going to go over those in great details. That would make a great Wednesday night study. But I think it's pretty simple to understand most of these terms in our English uh, understandings that these aren't good things. And so I'm not going to just go through and exegete those. That would be 23 more lessons on this whole passage, and we don't have that time. And so he says, of these things of which I have forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so this is, this is, this is important. So listen up. This idea that we're supposed to be sinless. There is a, there is a whole a Christian theology about the sinless perfections, that you can become sinless in this life. You use the fancy uh, Italian word, that's baloney. And we all know that. But there is a whole disposition and belief system and theology that says that you can work your way to perfectionism. But we know that's not the case. From our experience, at the very least. The Bible tells us that. He says, I forewarn you that those who practice these things, and this is an important word. The word here, uh, preso, is the root word from which we get several other English words, which I think is helpful for us to understand exactly what Paul is trying to get at in this thing. And so this is the word that we get practicing from, okay? Practice, practicing. And then that's an adjective, and it means to be actively engaged in a specific career or a way of life. So we get from, from this word parazo, we get this idea of consistency and practicing either a career or a manner or a way of life. We get practicum from this word as well. That's the course of study designed especially for the preparation of teachers and clinicians that involves a supervised practical application of previously studied theory. 
So when, when, when you are, are a, uh, a medical student, for example, there comes a time when you serve in what's called residency. So you're underneath the direct observation of a full doctor that observes your knowledge in demonstration. And so practicum is the practice of demonstrating a, a, a previously gained knowledge. Uh, also, practitioner. Now, that's a word that you hear quite often today in the medical field well. How, how many of you have ever heard nurse practitioner, for example? And so this idea is the one who practices, especially of one who practices a profession. And so maybe you're getting the idea here, but let's just get a little geeky here. This is a verb. It means it's, a, it's an action. And it's in the present tense, which means it's ongoing action. It's in the active voice, which means that, you know, that's the person himself or herself that is doing this action. And then it's also a participle, meaning that it has the little ing in English on it as an ongoing thing. And so when we read this word in there, what we mean is that those who practice these things, which had just been cataloged before, those who practice these things as a manner of life, as a practicum or as a practitioner or as a practicing these things ongoing as a major pattern in their life. It's not just a bump in the road. It's not just a slip and a fall. But these who practice these things will not see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? They will not go to heaven. On the flip side means they go to hell. That will be seen at the great white throne judgment when all are raised and the book will be read and no name of these who practice these things will be found in the book of life and they will be cast into the eternal lake of fire where it never is quenched, where the worm never dies and the torment never ends throughout all eternity. So what are we seeing today? We've seen that we've been commanded to walk or to live under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We've seen that we have a conflict, an ongoing conflict between the flesh, the old man, our old tendencies, our old predilections, what our physical body sometimes does to us, chemically, psychologically, internally, in our thought life. That we have a war between the flesh and also the desire of the Spirit to lead us into life of godliness. And we've seen that there's consequences. Consequences that, 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 that if we don't walk by the Spirit, it might be indicative of a pattern of life which tells us that we're truly not what we think we are, but we've been duped, we've been fooled, we've been uh, 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 hoodooed into thinking that we're someone that we're not, or we're not that we're someones, meaning God's, that actually has nothing to do with us. If you don't get anything else, remember this. You can't do life alone. You were never meant to do life alone. And you can't walk the Christian walk except through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Jack Taylor, again, the key to triumphant living, said it like this. The key is to depend upon the complete sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. To depend upon the complete sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. D.O. Moody said it like this. You can see without eyes, hear without ears, eat without a tongue, breathe without lungs sooner than you can live the Christian life without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. What about you today? Have you ever understood these truths? Has anyone ever told you about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit? It's quite possible that you, you've never heard such sayings as what has been said today. If that's so, please email me, call me. I mean, in the last few months, I've had more emails and more text messages about things that have been said from the Word of God or about the Word of God or how the Word of God applies to how we live this life. Don't think that you're bothering me at all. If there's one thing that I like to talk about, it's Jesus and the Word of God. How are you doing? 
at listening and letting him lead. That's something for you to reflect on today. But there might be others here or out there that have never heard this person and the power and the necessity and the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. Come today. Give me your name. Give me your number. We need to talk. We need to talk. It's a matter of life and death. So as our praise team comes to sing the invitation hymn, I'll be down front as always. And like I always say, most often say, do what the Holy Spirit says to do today. If he says get up and come down, come down to this altar, come speak to me, please do that by all means. We'll gladly receive you today. Can we all stand for our invitation?